All right. Welcome on. For the audience that does not know you, feel free to introduce yourself. Uh, sure. My name is Adrian Pockerell. I'm actually, I was born and raised in Nepal, Kathmandu. Uh, I was born in the eastern part of Nepal. I moved to Kathmandu and um, moved to the United States in 1995 for further education. Uh, I'm a disabled veteran now, served 14 years in the U.S. Army, married two children, two dogs, um, and my mother is visiting right now from Nepal. Nice. So you've had a very long career doing a lot of different things, and now you're running for Congress. And we're going to get to it all. So let, like, let's start at the beginning. So you weren't born in the United States, but you ended up moving. Why was that? Uh, like I said, you know, uh, first of all, America is has a dreamland for everybody. Originally, I came here uh, to go to college, uh, get my further education. And, but when you come to America, who doesn't love America? Ended up spending here, I, you know, I can't even believe it's almost 30 years now. Um, so after school, you know, ended up falling in love, the democracy, the ideology, you know, the rights we have and everything. There is no country in the world like America. Why would I live? So I ended up uh, staying uh, in America and continue serving the country in different fashion. Yeah, and I mean, the path that you led as an immigrant or, you know, someone coming from another country into the United States is it, it's kind of unique in a way because you took the route of like a, like a very like a patriot, basically. Right. You took the route of somebody that was very you know, loyal to the American government, to its people, to, to just America as a whole. So, you know, what what happened, like, like where did your career in the government start? Because you seem like you have a little bit of details on your LinkedIn, but I didn't, like, you know, get all of it. Yeah, so, you know, I came in 1995. Um, you know, after school, uh, 1997, I started working for the uh, Continental Airlines you know, as a baggage handler. Uh, I kid you not, uh, when I came here, I could not speak English. Uh, and then on the top of that, slangs. And I came straight to Texas. A lot of drastic change, right? Cultural change, uh, language barrier and all that. Uh, but I continue to fight all the obstacles, taking all this um, as a challenge and opportunity, turning into opportunity for a success. And after... Um, 11 years working for the airlines, I left the airline industry. Matter of fact, uh, during the 9-11, I was boarding the plane when I actually saw that event that we all remember what happened. That point from that time took me a long time, but over and over it kept coming into my head that I came to this country, the, the country welcomed me, people welcomed me, gave me all these opportunities what have I done for the country? I truly believe that I owe the country that has given me so much. So I ended up leaving the airline industry, joined the uh, U.S. Army. I served, uh, I joined the U.S. Army, uh, although that was 2001, many things happened. And, you know, 2008, I joined the U.S. Army as an enlisted soldier. Then I continue my school got commissioned in 2010 and became a military intelligence officer. So I served in the U.S. Army from 2008 to 2022, a combination of active duty, reserve, and National Guard. However, I was deployed to Afghanistan that I'm very proud of it. Uh, as you see my flag and all of this, you know, something the country and the people have given me. Uh, opportunity to do so and uh, during my deployment um, you know I have uh, several different types of injury I came back in 2014 from Afghanistan tw no, 12-13 and 2014 I was diagnosed with the PTSD lost a lot of friends um, more friends committed suicide and uh, but you know then I also had a problem with my uh, you know issues of the health, a disability and all that. 
but I did not want to give up. I continued to stay, and then I ended up joining NSA, National Security Agency. And after that, I wanted to something, you know, everybody has a dream. I had a dream to be a CIA officer, then um, applied and uh, got another opportunity from America and our, you know, lane to serve again. So join the CIA. And this December, I resigned from CIA. Uh, overall, I was like, oh, I served the country, our great nation that I'm always proud of, I'm, you know, proud of for over 20 years. But now this time, I just want to switch a gear a little bit from serving the country to serving the community and the people. And then I announced my candidacy for US Congress. Right. So one thing that's always fascinated me, and I, you know, without getting into too much detail, but also asking more about like what you've learned, because I've had on multiple people in the intelligence community, right, the FBI, the CIA, what have you, you know, DIA even. And it's it's always fascinated me. I don't know why. It's just like they're the careers, they're not, you know, it's not it's not a super public thing. It's not something everybody knows or understands. And yet it's also one of the most important careers that, you know, somebody can have, right? It's where we gather what we know about other countries, maybe even what we need to know about certain citizens. So, you know, it's not, it's not an out in the air, like the army or the Navy or what have you. And to one of your earlier points about, unfortunately, veteran suicides and a lack of mental health amongst veterans, I've had on six Navy SEALs um, so far, right? I've also had people that have just served in the army and, you know, in the past. And we spoke a little bit of this, about this uh, over the phone, where there are about one in every 22 veterans that commit suicide. And I've asked every single, or not every single, but most of the Navy SEALs that I've had on, I've asked this one question where I say, you know, if there was one thing in the government that you could change, like if you were the president, you had the power to change any law, whatever, you know, what have you, what would it be, especially with regards to the military? And the response is always about better, almost always about veteran mental health, that they would without a doubt change something about it. Now, when now that you're running for Congress, what are your plans, your routes to change or to help that in some way? So, uh, let me tell you on this mental health issue, it's not only veterans, you know, obviously we see a lot of things, right, uh, that affects our uh, mental health because uh, at the end we are human beings, right? But if you really look at it, this mental health issue, there are people with the sexual abuse, sexual molest, domestic violence, uh, child abuse, many things. You can have this mental health issue from simple and accident that you observe or you're part of it right? What it is, it's a war within yourself, thinking why it happened to me, right? And what is the, what is we're missing right now? That's what I want to focus on. Whether you talk about the kids getting into the fentanyl drugs and, um, you know, a mom's getting stressed out, a teacher's getting stressed out of the veterans. As far as the veteran, there are 23 veterans committing suicide a day. That is absolutely unacceptable. And in 2014, I was almost became one. The problem is, you know, we say there are a lot of resources. And I'll give you a simple example. Example. Think about it's like a river. The resources are on the other side of the river bank. And the people who are suffering pain in silence are the other side of the river bank. There is a river. We're not focusing on building the bridge there. The big stigma. Right. Think about it. Um, I'm assuming you in high school, right? Uh, the, uh, in a high school, all this bullying and everything that also affects the mental health of the student, right? And if you have to go to the particular mental health help, uh, you're gonna have that question. Somebody's gonna see me. They're gonna document it, and then somebody's gonna make a fun about me. Uh, what they're gonna believe? What they're gonna say? Right? So if I could change one thing to building the, uh, the bridge or having the peer support to holding each other hand, build that trust and take those people who need the professional help 
to the other side of the riverbank. And that's what we are lacking of it. We say we have all of this. And as a veteran myself, as a person gone through um, PTSD, and I'm going to be very frank, VA runs in a business model. Like if I need to talk to somebody, I have to call and make an appointment uh, two months later whatsoever, and I get 30 minutes, and it's more like an interrogation question. I need the emotional touch. And every time I go, I may see another doctor, you know. So I hate going it, and I want to change that for the veterans, that they don't have to go straight, I mean, go through the veterans. They give you this community service thing as well, but then you have to get the... Um, the uh, approval process, which also takes so long, right? I should be able to go seek out help anytime, anywhere, wherever I want to. That is very important on the veteran side of it. But I also want to tell you, as a military, I can probably come back and talk about it, you know, my deployment and have friends and this and that. But as an intelligence officer, you have what you have. You keep it and take it with you when you die. But as a human, the stress is there. Where can I go and let it out of my chest? Right? Very simple. Even your friends say sometimes get mad and that you get to talk to your other friend. What it happened to James? Just say, you know, he just went off. But the minute you let it out of the chest, you feel a lot of relief and you can think better. Right? Majority of the mental health is not being able to find in that space. I want to create the safe space in every place so people can easily go without thinking anybody's going to say something, think about it. And also, we need to educate the community. It's OK to have a PTSD or any kind of trauma, right? There's nothing to be embarrassed about it. And that's the one thing I really, everything I'm running into, uh, the cause for running for Congress is everything. We are mentally, our mental health is uh, you know, it's it's going into the danger side of it, right? We have a mental health crisis. Even if you think about COVID, people who have lost their loved one, right? They didn't even get to say the goodbye properly, right? You can't go back and change it. That's also creating a mental health. During the COVID, these financial challenges, creating a mental health. Mass shooting at the school, the minute I hear mass shooting, I have two daughters. It just gives me that what happened where it is, right? So we are having a lot of mental health issues and nobody is focusing on that. As an American, as a number one country in the world, I think we can do better. Well, you brought up an interesting point before that I don't think I've ever heard before, but now that I'm thinking about it, it makes a lot of sense. You had worked for both the NSA and the CIA, right? Both of which are agencies that, you know, whether or not they like to admit it, they do pride themselves on secrecy, right? On not being public, right? You know, they're, it's not like the army, it's not like the Navy. Their whole MO is secrecy, right? And whether that's for good or for worse is up for debate. You would know more about it than I would. But regardless of that, or independently of that, the fact of the matter is that a lot of, all of them in some way have to be secretive about what their job is, what they have seen, right? And, you know, whether it be you were a part of a mission to, you know, let's just say look into an arms dealer, right? And, you know, you have to watch videos or whatever to analyze certain things. And you see a guy die over and over and over again. It's similar. You know, I'm just naming an example, right? Or, you know, I've had on... Uh, CIA analyst Sarah Adams. She was the head of the Benghazi committee, right? And all day and all night, she's talking to terrorists, trying to get sources for different organizations. And obviously that negativity of just constantly dealing with this guy died, that guy died. You know, she even works for a humanitarian organization now um, in Ukraine, right? Which is, you know, she it, it's it's specifically for humanitarian work. But a lot of times Russians will accidentally kill some of those humanitarian workers in ukraine right they heavily monitor them it's a stressful it's a heavily heavily stressful job either you're getting spied on you have to spy on somebody else and you also have to deal with teammates of yours constantly dying 
right? But the difference between that and a regular military career is that you can't talk about it. So from your personal experience, without necessarily talking about specific details, how how do we solve this? Because on one hand, you can't have people in the intelligence community divulging secrets. But on the other hand, there needs to be some level of sympathy, right? Like you need to have some some air, right, to breathe, right, to talk to somebody. Is that the CIA's job, the NSA's job, or is that a community job? You know, how how secret is too secret, right? Well, you know, um, first of all, you brought up a very good point, right? And I want to, um, before I forget, I also want to add, when you say watching videos and stuff, right, talking about all of these other things you mentioned, think about our police force. Do you think they ever get a good news on the call saying, hey, somebody's having uh, this party, come on down? It's always somebody stabbing somebody, hitting somebody, some violence or some accident, right? Every morning or every day, whatever their shift starts, they push the gear and go out for what? To make sure me and you, our community is safe, right? But the bad publicity, what's happening right now, police department having a hard time even recruiting, you know, nationwide, right? And instead of acknowledging what they sacrifice, you know, we are somewhere, there is a gap. But they think about their mental health pressure. Uh, recently in Virginia, Sterling, uh, one firefighter lost his life, leaving three kids behind. They are here every day to ensure we are safe, our property is safe and everything. But nobody ever says thank you. We don't even acknowledge. It's like a forgotten in a sense, right? And when it comes to uh, keeping secret, right, there are people who has to do what has have to, uh, on whatever it requires to do to make sure we are safe. Those people on the intelligence community work tirelessly every day to ensure we are safe, our country is safe, and Americans around the world is safe. But there is nobody, nobody, if as long as if I know from my research, have ever stand up to say, look. They need help also. I resigned from this to be in the Congress, to be a big voice for all those are under my unsung heroes. Police, fire, EMT, healthcare worker. Think about this uh, during this COVID, right? How many nurses and doctors, we all have a fear of dying, but they spend hours and hours in the hospital, even with that fear and save a lot of lives. But at the same time, they could not save a lot of lives either. What happens in your brain when you see this happening in front of your eyes, right? Looking the videos to analyzing this, reading the report, right? Conducting operation and keeping it yourself. Where do you go on the top of that? The other part of it is the stigma they have that people are afraid if I say I have mental health issues, they probably going to connect me with something else and then I'm probably not going to get my you know my security clearance right but that's not what it is people misunderstand that no i was diagnosed with ptsd in 2014 and now I, I was uh, able to get a job in 2015 with the nsa in 2018 with the cia so that's a myth there but how can you break that all right what is in the society is only one way is to create that safe environment, right? I'm gonna uh, give you a little different example, like you in the school. If you have to go to the counselor and talk to the doctor, blah, 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 which is gonna hold you. But if you have a peer support group within your school, right? Like other students like you, who will listen and have those, because we all have a different story going in our mind. And you will feel more comfortable engaging with them and receiving a support without getting documented anywhere, without being noticed anywhere, right? You could go there just to listen. You don't have to speak. So definitely, you know, there is, there are things, even in the military, I was a military intelligence officer. So, you know, there are things we have to keep it to make sure we're successful to disarm 
or disrupt those who wants to harm us, right? But at the same time, we also need to realize we are human and we need to make sure we have that support. So that's why, you know, I'm fighting. Also, adding this little to um, additional to that, I was raised by a single mother and a teacher that I have seen on a first hand how much patience you need to be a teacher. And you go to school and you teach. You have your own children at home. You go to school and deal with a lot of other children and come back home, deal with your own children. And they're not, they're not getting paid enough. And I'm fighting. I'm, I want them to get good pay so they at least have a one list express so they can focus on the people like you to completely give their 100% because you guys are the future leader of the United States. Right. Everybody needs somebody to talk to. That's, you know, human connection is a necessity. We're social, we're social creatures by nature. So this is switching topics a little bit, but talking more about your career, right, in intelligence, whether it be the NSA and the CIA. In the CIA, you were a targeting officer. What was your job in the NSA? Uh, I was a second officer. So there are, you know, the way it is, just like in a military, we do whatever it takes to get things done, right? And if you ask me, the, the best answer it is that I said, I never fought for Democrat or Republican, I fought for American. So my job is to make sure to protect America and American citizens. Whatever it takes with my skill, my ability, whether if I know other languages, I can be helpful, or if I know the computer, system that I can be helpful, network system, whatever it takes, right? Um, so uh, that's all I can say about it. Right, and your job at the CIA was, you know, I've only had one other targeting officer analyst on what was your job like there? Because it seems like you've had similar job with Army Intelligence and NSA, generally similar. But at the CIA, you know, what can you say about that, you know, in terms of what your job exactly was in a day to day? So I give you an example in a different way for like you need to get and go get some grocery. Right. What do you do? You look at the coupon, you look at the ads and see which one has a sell, which item you should buy, how much money you have and what would be the outcome of it. Right. Similarly, whatever the mission is, what you're looking for, you're looking for the particular um, you know, information, particular, uh, whatever it is about the individual or the, you know, uh, infrastructure, whatsoever it is, right? And put it together to one package so you can go shop for what you have and make the uh, best out of it, right? Get the most out of your book. So, all right. So, when it came to the different jobs, like in the NSA, the CIA, and Army Intelligence, and again, depending on what you can share about everything, you know, is there anything that you learn from those jobs that you would say is going to affect your run in Congress in some way? Like anything you're going to try and change, work on potentially, you know, or that, or did you feel like it was overall? You know, good. You like you're not going to change anything there, or you're not going to work on anything there. So first of all, I said uh, mental health, right? Uh, building the bridge, or you know, um, eliminating those uh, gaps, connecting together, whatever it takes, and it's a multiple um, process. Whether it's the NSA, whether it's CIA, or the intelligence community, or police force, EMT, anywhere, or a school students right the mental health how can we what can we do to ease that mental health as far as what i've learned in america especially i'll share with you when i was in afghanistan fighting when i looked at the left look at right look at behind i never noticed was there a male female white black brown democrat republican right uh, transgender lgbtqia plus 
all I saw, we all were American fighting against the enemies and we had one mission. When I worked for NSI, CIA, same thing. We're all American. We had the mission to protect our national security, protect our country, protect our American citizens, whether they're inside the country or they're anywhere around the world, whatever it takes, right? Protect our children, every single thing. So everything I have learned is no matter what your background, the diversity we have, it's something to celebrate. The differences we have is something to make a strength to come out with a better solution, right? So it, it was great. And I'm looking into the Congress the same way. I'm running as a Democrat. And there were Republican uh, friends out there, colleagues, right? Both are, we are American. We want to do the best thing for the people. And their time is going to come out. We have to sit down together and use our differences as a strength and what can we do? For example, I'll say this. I'm a military. I love weapons, but I'm well trained, right? And let me ask you, if you look outside the window, would you like to see nice, quiet neighborhood, no police siren going on? Or would you like to see five dudes with a assault rifle walking around? Which one makes you feel safe, right? So what I say is the Second Amendment what can we do together to keep the Second Amendment right? But at the same time, make sure we are safe. Some people say gun doesn't kill people, people kill people. But my, my question is, if that's the case, why did you send me Afghanistan with a lot of weapons? The thing is, we got to figure out in this year itself, I read it in the news somewhere, that 5,000 people have lost their life. They're Americans. That's our brother and sister. Somebody lose their kids. Somebody lose their dad. Don't you think it's our responsibility to make sure we are safe in the country, not only outside, right? So uh, those are the things very close to my heart. The other thing I want to mention real quick to you, in Nepal, the way I was raised is my parents always say, you're young, it's our time to take care of you. When you grow up, it's your time to take care of us. And I look at the senior citizen, how they're struggling to get a Medicare. They're bouncing around all of this place. I feel so bad. You know, for me, all of those are just like my own parents. I want to make sure their life, I can make it easier as many ways as possible because uh, they're the one who worked hard when they were young to build this America that me and you are enjoying right now. And I think we, they deserve that. I don't know uh, if you have any um, you know, follow-up questions, but um, if it's unclear, please let me know. It makes sense. Yeah, I, I understand. And this is your point about fighting for America, right? A lot of people tend to feel like the government should not be as powerful as it is to some extent, right? Especially when it comes to organizations like the NSA and the CIA, right? A lot of people feel very strongly about them. They feel like secrecy should not exist in a government, right? And to some extent, that is, you know, a warranted belief. But what are your thoughts? Do you think that the government, you know, is... At what point should the government be transparent about what it does? You know, and again, you don't have to name anything specific, but I'm just curious on what your thoughts are on people that argue against government power. You know, these things are, you can interpret it any way you want, right? But if you think about it, if we want to be transparent and let everybody know everything about it, what the adversaries will do to us, you know? So there is a difference, you know, uh, we're not targeting, you know, X, Y, Z, this and that. We're making sure our national security is protected. We are protected. Let me ask you this. You live in the house, all right? You're young right now. So i um, talking about your parents, right? Uh, you have siblings? Okay. So your parents, right? You're, 
It's don't they want to ensure your house is safe and you are safe, right? And whatever it takes to make sure, putting the lock, putting the camera, all of these things. So when they put the camera, it will capture a picture of somebody else walking on the street. So now we talk about, oh, that camera is uh, you know, violating my privacy right whatsoever it is. No, you're protecting your, uh, your house. Same way, whatever we have to do to protect our country, our land, to ensure there's not going to be another 9-11 in America ever, to make sure nobody in this world can ever look up and try to challenge America. We are American. We are number one country in the world. And we got to make sure nobody damages us, our ideology, our freedom, right? So in order to do that, there are a lot of things must have to happen. But if somebody wants to challenge and, oh, okay, tell me everything. Just think about your house. Leave the house open. Leave the safe open. Leave everything open. All your jewelry open. We want to be transparent. That's not going to work. Right. Now, to the opposite end of the argument is that people feel that they are entitled to the right of privacy. And they feel as though when it comes to the government, they feel that, you know, it's wrong to have mass collection on a group of citizens that have not necessarily committed a crime. Right. Right. But the ultra, but the argument to that is, you know, it is to prevent terrorism, and that they are not specifically focusing on you. You know, what are your thoughts? I guess generally. So you know, that's a part of the law enforcement when it comes to in country. That's FBI, which one I never worked, so I have no knowledge of it. As a CIA officer, uh, that is not. Uh, what falls under me or you know that time <clears throat> it's outside the world other things outside the united states not the world what i mean other part of the world right but nothing in the united states so um honestly i do not know uh particular um uh, answers to, to that question maybe that will be a uh, question for federal bureau Right. They are the one in charge for what's happening in the country, whatever they need to do to make sure, again, their law enforcement, everything they're doing, believe me or not, uh, to make sure you're protected. Think about you just walk out in your neighborhood right now and there's something happened. And if those law enforcement knew about it and they captured that guy before anything, any incident happened, won't you be happy? You know, so people need to understand everything we are doing is to make sure we are protecting America. We're protecting Americans. And what is wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. Right. And now that you're running for Congress, this is partly moving away. But now that you're going to run for Congress and you're going to try and help mainly the mental health scape of you know not only just veterans but for people in general did anything what like when it came to what you've learned from the government from your experiences you know some of which uh, you know obviously you can't share but when it came to that how did your work in the government how did it change your perspectives that you might have had prior right like was there any differences that you had before and after leaving the CIA and the NSA and Army Intelligence, you know, and that's now going to affect your run. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, before I joined the military, I did not know. Uh, what does that mean? I, you know, a lot of time people say, thank you for your service. I still didn't know until I was deployed and what I had to go through, right? Um, one of the thing, let me take you back. Uh, I, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I came as a student, you know, what is to be an immigrant in the country in the beginning, how struggle, uh, you know, things you have to go through, how many struggles, right? Obstacles there and the language barrier. And then you join the military and you, what you see, what does that mean? Same way when I joined the intelligence community, that's when I see 
how stressful it can get right but you know this is what you swore in to serve the country and i'm all about commitment and serving the country you know so but in order to do that you have to do certain things and but that will create uh, a mental pressure just like earlier you mentioned uh about the person that uh who dealt with the terrorist uh you know talking looking at the videos and all of these things right think about if you watch a video every day beheading people is that going to impact you or not right so then i realized that that particular group doesn't have anywhere to share because where are you going to go share right uh actually i established a group uh, within the organization, uh, first time in the history, I was a founder and a chair of the group. And uh, within a year and a half, thousands of people became a member. Thousands of people start helping each other. And then, then I start looking, further looking. I mean, two years I worked for Houston Police Department. I start thinking about that as well, right? So a lot of times there are people around you near you who are suffering pain in silence right now what can i do is to make sure nobody's discriminating because of mental health right nobody they're afraid of it nobody's losing their clearance and how can i come from the upper level to handle that but let me also uh tell you i've been involved listening a lot of uh, presentation on this fentanyl, you know, uh, different types of drugs, uh, security and mass, uh, the internet and the phone and all of these things and the kids' mental health. Recently, I found out in uh, one of the county, 49% of the students in, uh, uh, right now are suffering for me from mental health. How is that possible being the number one country in the world? Our 49% of the kids are suffering from mental health. And everything they're established, there is a fear, and nobody's thinking about that, right? So it's not only in the military, it's not only in the police, not only in the firefighter, EMT, but single parents, working parents, businesses after COVID. You know, let me let me also mention that during the COVID, because the demand and supply, the price went up, right? For the uh, stuff, groceries. Now the price gouging there's no control and whatever you could buy for hundred dollars you can't even buy a 50 percent of that grocery uh anymore the price is going up but we, we're making the same money right so people are stressed in every single way how can we find the different type of cure how can we support what can a government uh, to do to assist our citizens you know, do you think I, I believe that having a health care is my, you know, right. You know, I should have a health care. But not many people have health care. You know, it's not a privilege, right? We're America, man. We can do a lot of things for American people. That's why I'm I would say I'm the only candidate that I have seen so far that I say America first and American first. You know, just like when you get on the plane and what they say, in case of emergency, put a mask first before helping others. I love helping, but we need to put a lot of masks for ourselves right now. Right. And so you've also spent a lot of time, you know, looking at because that's the CIA's job, right, to look at the international right outside of America and you're talking about americans first and america as well being first so my question would be you know do you think that there's too much of a concern in the united states with what's going on outside of the united states from americans that we need to help ourselves first before we start trying to help other countries should we get involved with other countries because that's a very big debate of people always asking you know oh the united states should be the superheroes they should you know be involved in everything and then there's the opposite which is that the united states should be involved in its own affairs before it gets involved in anything else right like why are we suffering from all these issues like what you're saying but then meanwhile we're going to go to war with another country you know like what are your thoughts on that argument 
Well, you know, being number one in the country, it's not easy, right? So when you are number one in the, I mean, in the country, in the world, uh, you are responsible for a lot of things. But at the same time, you have to balance it, right? Um, uh, quick example, say you are hungry, your mom is hungry, and your siblings are hungry and no food, and your dad is going to the neighborhood to provide the food, how would you feel? Today, 23 veterans are dying, committing suicide, because there is no help. They say it's a help, but there is a big, like I said, again, the gap. And nobody is thinking about the root cause of everything. Think about your, um, uh, you know, the children, help the children be there. When you work eight hours and drive two hours just to get back from work, you're tired. You don't have the energy. So in order to help the children, we have to think from the parents' perspective. How can we help the parents so they will have time to help the kid, be there for them, right? So definitely we have to, we have treaty, we have promises, and we are being in the number one country, uh, I mean, in the world, and, you know, best democracy and freedom, ideology, everything. Yes, we've got to be there, but we've got to figure out the, how to balance that to make sure we're not all over, but not nothing in where we're supposed to be, right? So for me is, we've gotta, we gotta put the priority. And you can always balance it out. Right. And going to mental health, you know, how it's currently being treated, right? Because we wanna make it better, but number one, how, obviously, like, you know, that's the main issue is always how, like, how do we realistically do this? But how is it currently, right? Like, you know, let's just say I'm working, yeah, you know, and also altering what's the differences between each, you know, either agency or organization. So, you know, how is the Army treating mental health as compared to the CIA? Is there any mental health care in the CIA already, right? Like, is there an on-staff therapist or psychologist that can help you? Or do you, do you maybe want to change it so that people can get it for free you know if they work for the cia like as a benefit right or the, the army or the navy whatever like how what are the pathways to change it but also what is now being done and maybe what's wrong with what's now being done so not only just the army cia every even private private organization you probably have heard they say employee assistant program, right? That to help whatever case may be, all right? Mental health, alcohol, uh, gambling, whatever it is, there is that. Um, earlier I mentioned, what is not there is to thinking about the building a bridge. And I'll tell you, one time I was reading through and I was surprised to see the medicine only helps 8%, 92% of emotional support. And if you really think about it, you wake up and right now you're in the school, right? So you wake up and on all your wake time, majority of the time you spend with your friends. As in my case, I spend with my I spend with my colleagues, right? When I get home, I'm tired, watch the TV a little bit, eat some dinner, and go to sleep. And weekend is spend time with the friends and family. So my most time that I spend with my colleagues and then my family and then outside friends on the weekend and all of that. So if those people support me emotionally uh, and like, <clears throat> then that is what is going to change, right? And the thing is when I know that, you know, when I talk, George really pay attention and he's listening to me and he is there for me, building that trust, right? There is no trust, and people are afraid. There are a lot of fear, a lot of stigma, and we need to get rid of that stigma. And it has to come from higher level uh, individual. When you work on the ground and bottom, uh, they always think that, yeah, you start working with your colleagues and a peer, but that needs to be supported from the higher level. Uh, earlier, I say, for say, you know, um, I had a nightmare last night, and I, I'm disturbed. I found myself in Afghanistan, all those 
visionary came back to me and I'm disturbed all day. I need somebody to talk to. Can I make an appointment now and go see a doctor? Most likely if I have a friend or family member who I'm close to and have built that trust that I can say and they will, I can lean on, that's what is going to help. That's what is missing, right? Uh, I still have this. I still take medicine, you know, uh, for my uh, PTSD. And I still have some of those days. Then I call some of my friends that I have, and I tell them, hey, man, this happened, this happened. We talk, and at the, towards the end, we, you know, come up with some jokes and laugh. And then I, I'm, I'm good. Okay, I'm okay now, right? So that emotional. Going to see a psychiatric, they will have uh, 10 questions or whatever it is. Have you thought about hurting somebody? Have you thought about, you know, hurting yourself, blah, blah, blah. I don't need that. I need, a, let's have a, you know, connection. Let's build a report so I can trust you. And if I can't see you this time and I can see somebody another time, and it's going to be the same thing over and over. And VA right now is running on the business model. That's supposed to be totally service model. What I mean by that, they're jotting down and putting every all the numbers and everything, and their goal is how to reduce the cost, not how to, you know, reduce all of this from the veterans. How to help, and that's definitely needs to be changed. Right. And, and, on yeah. and one more thing, and before I forget, right? One of the also things that what needs to be stopped in our government. This government shutdown that needs to come out from the bipartisan solution. It's not you get mad and this and that and you shut down the government. Think about those employees that's getting affected, right? Think about those small businesses within the government building who is making the little money to survive day to day. Now, government shut down for two weeks. What happened to those people? You know, their fight, that, that needs to be stopped completely. That should be never happen again, you know, and we need to realize because at the end, what is the politician job to make sure who elects you, that you become a voice for them and you also become a first line defense for them, right? To make sure we fight for their needs. That's our job. Not there to give uh, more stress to the people because we're not getting get along together and now make the other people suffer? Absolutely not. Right. We need people to look out for each other and to care for each other and have more sympathy. And people in the government need to stop looking at the people, the public in general, Democrat or Republican, as numbers. It needs to stop. This is something I've thought about is that, unfortunately, people in the government will a lot of times see people as numbers, money, you know, whatever. And that definitely needs to stop. It, it needs to, you know, become more about the government and the people in the government being public servants, not being the boss of the people. Yeah. Right. Which unfortunately is what it has become. Right. You know, one guy abuses his power a little bit. Nobody says anything about it. And it just spirals out of control. You know, and that whether that be money or on disagreements or just the interest of, you know, I don't want to look bad in this argument. I want, so I'm going to take time by shutting down the government. Right. And it's, it, it's, it's terrible. Right. I've had on former head of the New Jersey FBI on, and we, um, we spoke a lot about that right on the podcast where I, I'm like, what, what needs to change in leadership in the government? And he's like, people need to start getting the job for the job, not for what they benefit from the job or what for them, their friends might benefit from the job. Right. So when it comes to what you want to do, right. If somebody is to say, you know, we need to start cutting down on costs when it comes to mental health, you believe that there should be more resources on mental health, right? Far more. Absolutely. Absolutely. We need to invest a lot more on a mental health. Because, like I said earlier, 49% of the students in one county and the high school, right? Uh, the other part of it is I also say that in a school system, we need to start introducing the mental health from the elementary school. Um, I don't know how the, um, you know, your generation, because there's generation gap. But when I was in the school, 
when I was in a school, are you there? Yep, yep, I can hear and see you. Yep. Okay, I lost it. Okay. When I was in a school, a lot of time, right, we making uh, fun of people and laugh and this and that. That happened when I was growing up. I was bullied many times. And uh, maybe I have done similar thing. I don't know. But I grew up in that environment. And I'm thinking, if I would have knowledge of my small act, my small something, a word, how much it's going to impact somebody's life, the rest of the life. Maybe I wouldn't have done. And we don't know. It's more like a not intentionally or trying to hurt somebody. It's fun and joke and be cool. A lot of things we do. So it's important. The other part of it is that the law needs to be introduced from the elementary school. What I've seen is a lot of kids, when they're in high school, they know if they do something wrong, they get caught, they go to jail. But they don't understand the consequences, right? It's going to stay with them for the rest of their life, right? I think we're lack of teaching that in this uh, in the school. And same thing with the STEM. Um, uh, like India, they start teaching quantum computing in seventh grade. Who are so behind, and we're the number one country in the world. So we also got to change stuff there, you know, in the school from the get go. We got to start changing. It's gonna. It's a process, but we can definitely do, do it. All right. Yeah. And when it comes to advice you would want to give to young people, right? Like what advice would you want to give to young people listening? Uh, one of the things is you guys are the future leader of America. You guys have a power to shape this country, right? And you guys are a new generation. You have that new ideas. Uh, you need to participate in the politics to change the innovations and everything, right? If you are not there, uh, we are running way behind, uh, you know, many years back. But you come up with the new ideas, new thought process, you know, a new way of doing, innovating all of these things. I ask you to involve. The other part of it is, please try to understand as a human being, instead of making fun, bullying, you know, be a friend there because they're probably su suffering pain in silence. And if they ever, if you hear, you know, something ever happened to somebody, I mean, I'm pretty sure those people who have lost their friends during the mass shooting, you know, it stays with them forever. On the, although we cannot change anything, but it also comes a question about what could I have, have I done, right? And be stand there for what is right, what is wrong. And let's make this America, despite how we look, what our race, what our ethnicity, you know, what our education level, let's think about there is one nation, one race is a human race, in one identity, American. Let's not let this adversary trying to do the influence operation, trying to create a division. A lot of us don't know, we don't think about it. They're trying to create a division and create a fight in between us. So they want to see, right? We are falling apart. You know, also as an immigrant, I will also say, look, you know, one way or the other, somewhere sooner or, you know, many years ago, beside Native American, we came from somewhere. This is something we need to be proud of it, right? Uh, some leadership say immigrant poised this country. I'm an immigrant. I serve this country. I walk around limping, but I'm still proud that I got to do this, right? So we are all American. Let's think about as an American, what can we do together? And you guys need to come and take a spot on the politics, bring those new ideas, innovations. Don't think you need to wait until so-and-so, right? Right now you're doing this interview. How many 17 years old doing this, right? So you took this initiative and I'm proud of you. So continue to do that, you know, encourage other to do 
uh, get involved in every single thing we can, whether local politics, uh, national, you know, state level, but par participate. So a person like me can hear what are your concerns? What can I do to make your life uh, better? One of the things I want to mention real quick that I'm asking free community college, right? When you graduate, you go to another place, drastic change, new lifestyle, having that free community college that two years time gives you a life adjustment. You don't have to worry about paying the tuition, but also I'm asking while you on full-time student and you maintaining grade level B or higher, everything you work, if you make $10 an hour, no tax, you should be able to get $10 uh, bring home. That means you have to, you can work less hours and focus more on a school and a study and graduate. You know, we need to uh, aim higher. We need an education. Our all youth graduate from community college, a bachelor, master's, and all of these things, right? Education is important. All right. I think that is a pretty good place to end off. Any any final send offs? Any last words before we talk a little bit after the show? Um, my last word is: America is the country uh, of opportunity for all of us. We all are American. Let's get together. Let's show the unity for the community. Let's think for the people. Uh, you know, don't get into division, but find a way to unite us together. Let's celebrate the diversity. Let's make our differences as a strength to be, you know, most powerful like we are in the world and don't let our adversary break us apart. Thank you very much. All right. I'm going to stop recording. We'll talk a little bit after the show, but it was fun having you on. Thank All you right. very much. No problem. Thank you for having me.